connected. Welcome everyone to our webinar on teaching strategies for today's first year students. Um, we will get started in just a minute. Let everyone have a chance to get settled. A welcome to you all. Again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. Just doing a little bit of, of housekeeping here as everyone joins. Please feel free to tell us where you're joining from in the chat as everyone's getting settled. Um, once we officially get started, I will start a poll so we can get to know y'all better. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. We have just a minute before we get started. I'll let everyone get settled as everyone's joining. All right, New Jersey, Utah, Portland, Maine, Georgia, the Netherlands, welcome. A lot of places that I would wouldn't mind visiting as we <laughs> here. So absolutely, coast to coast. I saw Pasadena. We've got Maine, San Diego. Um, welcome Kenya. Welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and get started as everyone's joining. Um, so welcome. My name is Andrea Bergoa. I'm the Higher Ed Marketing Manager here at APA Publishing. Um, today's session is Study Like a Champ, Teaching Strategies for Today's First Year Students. Um, we decided to start today's session with a poll. So please let us know about your experience um, teaching. Um, so we have two questions. Uh, first, we'd like to know what setting do you currently teach in? Um, if it's other, you can let us know in the chat. Um, we're so glad to have you here. Our second question is, what are the biggest issues you're seeing right now with teaching first-year students? Again, if it's other, we would love to hear from you in the chat. Uh, we know that these multiple choice questions are not exhaustive and <laughs> don't summarize your whole experience. So um, it looks like I'm going to keep this going for just a minute so we can get everyone's responses. Um, but it looks like we're about 68% uh, four-year college university with about 23% two-year community college. Our high school representatives, hello, welcome. We've got about 3% and then 6% at other. Um, all right, I'm going to end the poll in three, two, one. And I will share this with everyone so you can see as I'm getting started with the rest of our, our presentation. So um, thank you so much for your interaction in chat already. Um, I do want to share that everyone is muted just to avoid any accidental interruption of today's session. Uh, we definitely encourage chat, though, um, especially to interact with your fellow um, attendees, participants. Please, please use chat. We do have Q&A available as well. So use the Q&A functionality to communicate with myself, um, Dr. Dunlosky, and Dr. Gurren. Um, and then um, we will be sharing resources post-webinar. So this session is being recorded, and we will send it it to you as soon as it is available um, with captions and a chat transcript. So you will have access to all of that. Um, and also by attending today, you will be receiving an attendance certificate um, from us verifying that you did attend today's session. So thank you everyone who's here. Um, I'd like to welcome you again to our session on teaching strategies for first year students. Um, this is featuring the authors of Study Like a Champ. Um, Dr. John Dunlosky and Dr. Regan Gurren. I would like to begin by welcoming our panelists. So you can already see them on the screen, um, but I will also introduce them here. So um, 
Dr. Regan Gurung is a professor of psychological science and associate vice provost and executive director for the Center of Teaching and Learning at Oregon State, uh, winner of the American Psychological Foundation's Charles L. Brewer Distinguished, Te Distinguished Teaching of Psychology Award and the U.S. Professors of the Year Wisconsin Award. Um, he is also a social psychologist whose work focuses on improving teaching and learning. And then we've got Dr. John Dun Dunlosky. He is a professor and director of the Soul Center in the Department of Psychological Sciences at Kent State. Um, Dr. Dunlosky's research program has focused on understanding three interrelated components of self-regulated learning. One, monitoring of learning. Two, control of study time. And three, the application of strategies during learning. Um, so we welcome both of you here today. Um, I will be serving as the moderator for this panel. Um, so most questions will be coming directly through me. Um, and I would really like, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because the focus here <laughs> is not on a PowerPoint. We're having a conversation today. So uh, the first question I would like to pose to our panel um, is really what should faculty and really anyone who interacts with first year students remember about being a first year student or keep in mind when they're interacting with first year students? You know, that's a great lead off question there, Andrea. Uh, and I think there are two things that come to mind straight off the bat. And the first thing I'd like to say may actually not be what some of you are expecting, but being a first year student today is not even the same as it was being a first year student five years ago. So I'm not saying 10 years ago or 15 years ago or many, many more years ago that John and I were first year students. Uh, first year students today, I just it's just not the same thing. Uh, and I'm not just saying, you know, digital natives or this or that, but it's not the same thing. And so we can try and say, you know, let's put ourselves in their shoes. But there are things that we have to factor in and uh, that are different. And the big ones are just the pressures on first year students today are a little different or the average first year student is is working a lot more uh, and just never forgetting that the average student is taking four other classes and in addition, maybe caregiving and so on and so forth. So when I look out at, at that student and I'm thinking, how are you doing on my assignments or why aren't you working on my assignments? I really got to factor in what all else is going on in your lives uh, as I think about my pedagogy and, and things like that. So. Yeah, and I want to add a couple to that, too, because there's some um, things that I used to think about undergrads that uh, that were incorrect. Right. And that I realize now understanding how I think and how they think are, are very, very important. And one is that they don't share the same learning goals that I have. So as a young assistant professor, I had these pie in the sky goals for how I thought that the undergrads were behaving and what they wanted. That is, everybody wanted A's. Everybody wanted the same kind of thing from the academic experience. And that's absolutely not the case. What I do find, however, is not only do their goals differ greatly from mine, but unfortunately, often they have underdeveloped goals. And I don't mean they don't know what major they want. They're just not quite sure what they want to do. And really, this kind of plays into the time management aspect of, of being a successful student. It's like you really have to kind of learn about yourself. So one thing I think many of the students that we get are kind of underdeveloped in that sense, that they really don't know what they want. And again, this is just not knowing what major you want, but just not knowing a lot about who you are and what you want to be. And I think we can go a long way to help them do those kinds of self-discoveries moving on. And of course, we all know they held a lot of myths about learning and what it means to succeed. And of course, I'd like to fix those right up as well. But You mentioned the myths about learning. So could we, we maybe expand on that a little bit? What are the most common myths that first year students come into college with and how can we help them debunk those? I've, I've got two. Can I start reading? Yeah. So um, the biggie that everyone has been talking about is that we all, to some degree, hold this myth of learning styles. And I, I don't want to beat this down too badly because I think if you're probably connected to this webinar, you already realize that learning styles are somewhat of a mixed bag, right? And just to put it simply, all of our students have real learning preferences. 
It just turns out it's not always a great idea to teach to someone's learning preferences because it's not the best way to teach them, right? So multifaceted ways are much better way to get students to understand. But And we could talk more about learning styles if you want and the evidence that suggests it's not good. The, the one, though, that's near and dear to my heart that really is frustrating to me when I'm working with students is what I'm seeing more and more of. And it's, I'd call it, I'm not sure if there's a name to this myth, Regan, but it's that learning should be easy, right? That if I'm not having an easy time with this, then something's wrong. And unfortunately, the opposite is true. <laughs> I, in fact, I don't know a context where learning is easy unless you already know the content. So in fact, learning should be difficult and challenging and at times frustrating. But the reward, of course, is getting over those challenges to finally succeed. And I think uh, beyond the learning styles myth, if somehow we could work on this myth with students to help them understand that when they get frustrated, when they're having challenges, when things get difficult, it's not because it's them that's having issues. It's just because learning is difficult for everyone, right? So if it's not easy, don't give up, but maybe seek help. So those are two of the big myths that come to mind. Regan, do you have any other? Yeah, you know, uh, my you took one of my biggies, which is that that learning is is should be easy. Uh, you know, I actually in my class, even though most of my students have not seen the movie, I always bring up the Princess Bride. You know, and I say to them, there's this great line in there where you know the Dread Pirate Robert says, uh, "Life is pain, princess, and anybody who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you something." And I say that's the same thing with learning. You know, uh, and there are places out there that are trying to sell you that learning is easy. And that's wrong. You know, uh, watch out, people. There are AI companies that are saying, hey, students, uh, want to get your homework done quickly? Sign up for us. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, should it, it, it should be easy. Uh, you know, I, I saw in the chat, uh, Christina from New Jersey mentioned how her students, you know, often are looking at the grade versus for learning. And I think it's the same thing. You want it easy. You want that grade to be easy. And you're more likely to say, oh, I'm going to pop some money down, 20 bucks a month for this AI service that'll make my learning easy. Well, so underscore on that big myth. Uh, another big one I want to bring up is the myth that, multitasking is easy, all right? Uh, I will tell you one of my current peeves, and I'm glad you put your thumbs up, John, because my thumb, the thumb is what drew my attention. In class, I remember showing this great clip on memory, and th there was a student doing the thumb swipe, all right? They were doing the thumb swipe on their phones. And I spoke to them afterwards, and I said, you know, didn't you find that clip absolutely fascinating? And they were like, oh my gosh, yeah, that was so neat. And then I said, but you were swiping Instagram. I could see you, right? And they said, oh, but that's how I listen. And I think there's this belief that they can do these other things. And uh, that's why when I think about studying and I think about all those, those roadblocks and those diversions and those bumps in the road, uh, you know, or any of the things that you and I have written about in, in Study Like a Champ, one of the biggest starting points to think about is, is uh, social media and how to think about social media. So, uh, you know, for me, that thumb swipe, that thumb swipe, that whole, here I am, I can do my social media, but that, gosh, if you were to say to me at the end of this, I'm going to give you the sneak preview right now, right, in case you have to head off, addressing how our students use social media and their use of their phones is one of the biggest things that we can do to help them study better. So there I said it. Um, Regan, do you want to expound on that a little bit? Because I know we've had a lot of questions about use of technology, use of cell phones in the classroom, um, and just really in general, keeping up with changing technology um, and yeah. students interaction with it. So actually, you know, thanks for that, uh, because I can tie that into an expansion of, you know, what's different with our first year students or second year mm -hmm. students, third year students. Uh, and that is there's a much closer reliance on technology and social media. Uh, it's just such a part of the fabric uh, of, of lives. There's, there's a lot of data out there that's, I don't think that they're not as aware of. And I'm gonna, if I may, give you the pro and the con, right? And uh, of this, yes, there's data out there. Uh, 
But the very first thing that I think we need to do is to be able to talk about that data and share it with our students. Now, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second, but just sharing it with the students is even not enough, but it can actually change some behaviors. Uh, I teach introductory psychology. Uh, my classes in the fall are 400 students. Uh, in the winter, they're often 300 students. So I'm talking about a lot of students. And uh, I have built into class time talking about studying, not surprisingly because of the research on it, but not just talking about class time, but talking about phones and distraction. And uh, for those of us teaching psychology and intro psych, it's easy. We have sections on cognition and memory and so on. But I would say to the, the folks out here, please, 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 no matter what you're teaching, what level you're teaching, carve out time to both address ways to study, but also directly address phone usage. So if you're going, but I don't know enough about that sort of stuff, good news. Uh, I answered this question so much that I literally just put together a short 1000 word piece that summarizes all the recent literature on phone usage, distraction, why vibrating phones are bad. And if we have time, I'll, I'll share some of those really cool uh, studies out there that I share with my students. But that's what I do. I go into class and I say, check out this study. And I'm just gonna give you one teaser, right? I mean, a study that just came out, uh, you know, it's a January 2024 piece on phones on vibrate versus uh, responding. And in this study, three groups, students did a, a task, a learning task without their phones present, or and that and in two other groups with a phone present but set to vibrate, phone present where if they got a message, they could actually respond to it, right? And you won't nobody here would be surprised to know that uh, nobody here would be surprised to know that those two conditions where the students had their phones, they did worse than the students who didn't have their phones. No big whoop there. But check this out. Right In those two conditions, vibrate versus respond, the students who had their phones on vibrate did worse because their phone was vibrating and they were so distracted by the fact that they couldn't respond, right? That's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and and I, I, I'm, I'm sure you're going, don't tease me, where's this piece? Uh, it'll be coming out in the teaching professor in about a week or so. Uh, and if you don't subscribe, I will make, I will make it available for you uh, because it, there's just so much really good stuff there that you can walk into class and in 10 minutes, shock the heck out of people with how damaging their phones can be. And I mentioned pros and cons, I have to give you the con. Uh, I do this in class, right? Uh, students do this in class. And then I say, hey, people, let's do a little fun activity. I've just given you all this data on why phones are distracting. Should we as faculty ban them? And I'm going to ask you right now, if if you have your chat open, what percent of the class do you think would say yes? Anybody have a guess? People, give us some guesses. Put up some numbers in there. 10%, all right? Yeah. Oh, man. Across yeah. It's all across the board okay, here. The, I, I saw one 85%. I saw some 40s and 50s. 30 Actually, 24% of them said yes. The overwhelming majority said no. And I've just given them all this data. I've just shown them. And, and on the upside, because, you know, and then I, I said, why? Why would you say we don't ban it? And, and you can guess. Freedom. We'd like the freedom. Okay. And that's all good, but here's where I'm going to lob it back to John. Self-regulation. Freedom is great, right? But if you don't have the self-regulation, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's not good. And I've seen some of the chats, uh, comments in the chats up here too. I, I totally understand why, say, a, a high school teacher might say, well, yeah, have a video playing in the background while you're studying. Um. And the student, unfortunately, they'll have the video, they'll be having a better time, things will be easy, they're flowing with their reading. But unfortunately, they're still multitasking, bouncing, bouncing back and forth. The student will get the sense that they're learning well, because this is fun, but they won't be learning as well, right? In fact, the research is pretty clear that uh, having distracting noises in the environment is bad. So don't get me wrong, some music, if it calms you down, right, and helps you to focus, fine. Now. I'm also often asked this question by students, should I listen to music when I'm studying or not? And unfortunately, my answer is a little bit more nuanced than, oh my goodness, turn the music off. Because 
it's like, well, if you don't have the music on, will you study? So a lot of them say, well, I can't even study if I don't have music on. I'd rather at least have them try to engage, right? With the music on than not engage at all. So I'll take a half focused student than a non-focused student. But, you know, we'd rather have them do things more efficiently. And, and I think this is part of it, trying to tell them, well, if they use better practices, not only will they learn better, but they'll do this more efficiently, right? So they'll get done more quickly. They'll learn more quickly, so forth. So it's a double-edged sword. The technology is a double-edged sword because I, I use a lot of technology in the classroom. It just, you know, everything, every technology, right, that we love and adore, including indoor plumbing, has negatives. And as instructors, we have to understand both the positives and negatives of those, right, as we're trying to decide what to ban. And by the way, as an instructor in a university, there's no way in the world I would ever ban cell phones from my class. I would be, I don't know, I, th I think I would be removed from the classroom. They vote and you off the island. I think they vote me off the island, yet I hear people saying they want to ban, you know, people from using computers to take notes with, which I think is equally unfortunate but whatever well and 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 hopefully we can get into note taking because that's a big deal i did i did want to respond to one thing that i i saw uh in in the q a uh colleen mentioned about how many of her students you know use their phones as security blankets uh and you know as a psychologist and you know when i when i when i when i think about and talk about uh learning in class we talk about you know behavior substitutions and it's real uh i gave i'm trying to see if i have one of them around here um i gave i gave i had this is a, a squishy pumpkin but i have squishy brains and when we talk about the brain i bring my little squishy brains to class and i give it out to students and uh, I'm still struck by what this one student said to me when I gave her the little squishy brain. She said, and with all seriousness, she said, this is so helpful because when I feel like reaching for my phone, I can reach for this instead. You know, it is such a, and I saw folks saying, you know, addictions and so on and so forth. So, so yeah, it's, there are, I don't think there's a single solution and John, I'm with you. I think a ban is definitely not it. Uh, I think uh, discuss it share the data and explore with students uh, ideas that would work. Uh, I'll say this academic year, the 23-24 academic year, I've had numerous students come to my office and say, Dr. Gurung, please help me not use my phone. Okay, and and that that touches me. I mean, wow, that's one level of, you know, I, I, want, I want to not use it, but I just can't, please help me. Yeah, and I think having these conversations with the students is is critical. I, I noticed in the chat where someone said, well, you know, these are adults. They should make their own choices. That's true. At Kent State, when someone takes my class, like I, again, like Regan, I have, you know, 130 students in a class. Each student pays about $150 to sit in one class day. Well, they can make their own choices, but if one student is using their phone and actually research shows potentially disrupting the learning of other students around them. Well, now they're making a choice for themselves, but as well as for the other students. And that's difficult to manage. And all you can do is ask them to please behave, not be disruptive and, and keep to themselves. Uh, but it's very difficult thing to do. All right, so I think, um... Your mention of note taking, Rehan, has inspired some discussion in the in the chat. So, um, I was hoping we can kind of move in in that direction. I I have so many questions and thoughts on everything we've talked about so far, and I think everyone else does. But, um, you know, there are a lot of questions on how do we get them to take notes by hand. It, how do we get them to put their technology down to take notes um, and minimize distractions? So, would love to hear your thoughts on note-taking and how we can um, encourage good note-taking and helpful note-taking. So, so John, yeah, John, you want to jump in? Because I've you got- can go, You can go first. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I do want to jump in, Andrea. I'm going to, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to jump in on a word that you used, right? And we hate it when people do that. But uh, when you said take notes by hand, all right? Because that's a great starting point. Do students need to take notes by hand? 
uh, you know, had a great chat with uh, Danny Oppenheimer recently. Uh, and many of you may remember Mueller and Oppenheimer 2014 that really started the banning of laptops in the classroom. Uh, but as, as Oppenheimer, as Danny nicely said, the real key here or the problem with laptops is that it, students are taking notes verbatim. By, by virtue of the fact that they can type faster and, you know, capture things faster, uh, when they're on a laptop, they are taking things verbatim. And when they're taking things down verbatim, they are not processing as much. And that's really what's going on with the learning, right? So I, I think it's easy to say, uh, uh, problem solved, take notes by hand. Well, Unless, and you know, I, I saw a number of you saying they should they should take better notes and they should learn how to take notes. Absolutely, we've got to take the time to tell students how to take notes, because the issue with technology is not so much that, uh, you know, in in so much the quality of the notes. People can take bad notes while writing, or people can take bad notes on a computer. The real issue, I think, that we've got to really think about is uh, distraction. And that's what I tell my students. I say, you can take notes however you want, that, but a laptop or a phone or an iPad or, you know, is much more likely to be, you know, to be distracting. I mean, right now I use some, you know, a, a, a pad to take notes, but the only thing it does is convert my handwriting to, to uh, you know, capture my handwriting. It, it doesn't even have a clock on it. There's no distraction on there. That's the issue with 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 the laptop and the technology, uh, and and I should also say just remember that it depends. Uh, the laptops and technologies give students access to online resources, provide affordances, uh, links to web links, whole range of things. So we've really got to think about when's the best. Uh, I mean, talk about note taking and how best to take note taking. And there may be some types of classes that you know typing it out may be better for. So, you know, definitely the key bottom line here, though, is we need to really share with students that note taking is not just capturing what the instructor is seeing or what's on a slide, but it's an opportunity for review. It's an opportunity for retrieval practice. It's a world of opportunities that too many of our students today are just missing out on when I, you know, when I don't see note taking right there. So. I'm going to jump in, Regan, because. Yeah. Danny and I have gone to fisticuffs about all the research on this. And uh, I'm going to agree with you. It doesn't really matter whether you use a longhand laptop. Uh, research is pretty definitive on that. But what I want to make clear to everyone on the webinar, students, and there's lots of re decades of research on this. Before 2014, the research was clear. Okay, And it's that when you take, say, two groups of students, one taking notes during a lecture, whether it's by laptop or by hand, longhand, and one that doesn't take notes, another group that doesn't take notes. And then you test them over that content. Okay. Typically, the both students, groups of students perform the same. So literally, the act of taking notes doesn't really lead to a lot of learning, right, beyond just sitting and listening to it. So really, those notes are more like an artifact that students need to have so that they can subsequently learn more. And the idea now is regardless of how they take those notes, that all the right kind of content to support their learning is in there. And one way I find that really useful to engage students in class, you have them take, you know, they're taking notes and standard lecture or something like this. And, and about halfway through the class, you say, okay, I have a question for you. And it's about that last 30 minutes of your lecture. And you ask them, well, to answer the question, but don't look at your notes. And most folks, if they're normal, like myself, won't remember the answer. Because if you're listening to something, you quickly forget what you hear, right? You're taking notes, by goodness, right? The key, though, is then you say, well, that's okay if you haven't basically learned this yet, because your goal now is to learn and embrace this as you're studying for the exam and as you're working with me and so forth as the class moves on. But your goal is to see if you can answer it from your notes, okay? And the question is always something that I'm going to ask on the exam. So if it's not in their notes, now there's a very good chance they're not going to get this correct on the exam. And it's, it's a teachable moment because when they go back to look and I said, okay, it wasn't there. And I'll admit this time it's on me. I apologize. I didn't demand you put those in your notes. But if it wasn't there, it might mean you're not taking complete notes. And it kind of allows us to have a discussion about note taking. I do this once a week. 
And I tell the students why I'm doing it. So they can not only evaluate their understanding, like are they getting this and can ask questions, but also have a chance to see if they're taking complete notes. And if they're not, then one alternative is they take more notes or get together with a friend, come to my office hours so I can help them with their, and so forth. So um, with that said, depending on the students, there might be a variety of ways they could take notes effectively. So I wouldn't want to limit someone or ban laptops or, or anything like that, uh, because an individual with some certain disabilities might have difficulties using one, one technique versus another. So uh, with that said, though, I, there's nothing magical about note-taking. There's a lot of magical about bad note-taking, which leads to, to poor performance and, and basically bad exams. Okay. And, and, and John, let me just riff on that a little bit because uh, uh, Abraham, great post uh, in in the chat about uh, you know some studies showing that uh, when an instructor provides notes, they outperform students, right? And I think that's such a great example of if the note quality is bad, it's not going to be good. So I don't think it's enough for us. And I and and I think what John and I are big advocates of is not just look out at the students and see whether they're taking notes or not. Is really take a step further and go, what the quality of those notes? Uh, you know, after after every exam in my class, uh, I email. Uh, the folks who get high scores and I uh, email the folks who get low scores. And I invite, especially the folks who get low scores and to be fair, who fail, uh, to come in and chat. And one of the first things we do is look at notes. And I can tell you, uh, just like that point right there, you look at somebody's notes and immediately you can get a sense of something that captures a lot of the variance in what's going on with their learning. So don't just say, hey, people take notes, provide examples. Uh, in the in the Q&A, there was another, uh, you know, there was a, something related that I want to tie into here uh, if we don't tackle it elsewhere, uh, study guides, right? Uh, with study guides, just like what John was saying about notes. Yeah, we can provide study guides and that's not bad, but the true, learn, you know, having your students create their own study guides, maybe the first time you show them, Right, but but providing a model of a study guide and students creating their own study guides again, that's creating more deeper processing, and it's it's a strategy that all of us who teach can work into our course design, and and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a little bit of these little feelers to other connections here, but by putting it into our course design, I am very I don't want to be implicit, I'm gonna be explicit. We've got to examine how much content we feel we have to cover. Because the biggest man, and way earlier up in the chat, it's been streaming like crazy, but way earlier in the chat, somebody talked about, I'm trying to cover 16 chapters. When do I have the time for all of this? Content, people, don't be shackled to content, right? And I know some of you will say, but intro psychs on the MCAT, or, or you know, nursing students have to do this, or this and that. I hear you, but the reality is, the average instructor, and this is not abstract, uh, when I did some work with APA's Intro Psych Initiative, we collected data on this. The average instructor is pressured to get, to cover more content that's needed and is, is, is so, so tight shackled, I love that word, uh, is so shackled to I must cover all this stuff that where is the time to do all the things we're talking about that may actually be the most important, right? That may actually be the most important. I mean, yeah. When I was younger, I taught everything. Now I teach very little, less is more, right? The key is like, I'm gonna just teach you the most important aspects of cognitive psychology that I think are valuable to you in this particular class. And we're gonna to work together as a team to learn it. So uh, we don't cover all the topics. We cover those that uh, in this particular context, I think are most important. So I think less is definitely more in many, many, and the, and the way to impress folks about this, everyone out on this webinar has a higher degree of some sort. Think about when you were in college, unless you just recently graduated, and about how much content you really remember from any of those courses. We all know college is valuable, but if you really don't remember much of the content you learned, other than what's in your expertise, what is the value of those courses? And epiphany for me, talk about epiphanies here, is oh, geez, most of the students in my classes aren't going to be cognitive psychologists. Oy, maybe they don't need to know everything I know, but maybe they need to understand 
aspects of cognitive psychology that can help them deal with their lives that they might take home with them and remember 10 years from now. And I even tell my students that I'm going to teach you three things this semester, and I hope you remember one of them 10 years from now because they will be very valuable to you. Of course, you're going to have to remember a lot more to, to pass the exam, but whatever. So there's, a, you know, there's always that little wiggle room to go. That was great. <clears throat> I feel like y'all are doing my job for me here. Um, I, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with it. Um, I think one of the um, one of the things I want to pull out of chat, because I'm seeing some conversation about this, and I would love to address it, um, is the use of AI. There has been some, some suggestion that AI could support in note taking, um, but I'd like to broaden that topic just a little bit in how we can approach AI with first year students in regards to academic integrity, critical thinking, things like that. And Regan, I know I know you have an answer on, on this one. Yeah, uh, a, lo a lot of answers. I, I think about AI a lot. I'm on our universities, multiple <laughs> university AI committees and so on and so forth. Uh, while I answer, folks, another quick question for you. If you have never used ChatGPT, just say me in the chat. If you've never used ChatGPT, so I'm not talking about Dolly and imaging stuff, but if you've never used ChatGPT, put, put, put something in there and let's see. All right. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and so so first off, I'll say uh, that's the, the number of me's in there is is not surprising at all. Uh, before I dive into the to the answer, please, 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 people, the next time you have, open up ChatGPT and give it a shot. All right, uh, I'll give you some really good reasons to do that. Uh, the simplest one, the simplest one, if you need one, uh, there are just so many ways to incorporate uh, AI in. And I and I know, I think uh, Ali also had a, a, folks about, a question about including technology and we'll get there, but let me answer the AI question first. Uh, the reality is I think AI can make a lot of tasks relatively simple, all right? Uh, there, there are, when I think about AI, there are three big, probably a couple of big level things that we need to think about is, is increasing AI literacy. Uh, we need to think about, uh, the ethics of, of using it, uh, AI and, and we use, uh, I mean, you really need to think about the, the usefulness of it. And I have a very simple acronym that I like to use. Uh, I like to tell folks, you know, and I'll tell you, Hey people get a feel for a AI right? Get a feel for AI. And it's F-E-A-L that reminds me to say, always ask yourself before you consider AI, is it going to be faster? That's the F, all right? Is it going to be faster? And many of you may say, oh, it's going to be faster. Obviously, it's going to be faster. Well, not, not exactly. And you'll see why in a second, right? So is it going to be faster? That's the F. Is it ethical to use it? All right. Is it accurate? All right. And are you really learning? All right. My simple four, is it faster? Is it ethical? Is it accurate? Are you really learning? Uh, and the accuracy, I think you've already, uh, thanks, Andrea, you, <laughs> the accuracy is a big deal, right? Even now, even now, uh, 14 months after the birth of ChatGPT or the latest version, uh, AI still makes mistakes. And instead of using the common term uh, hallucination, uh, I think the better term is failures in approximation. Okay, uh, it's trying, but it's it's not doing it right. Okay, uh, I love a term that came out of the University of Washington, where both John and I uh, spent some time together in the same corridor. Actually, uh, uh, Emily Emily Bender at the University of Washington says, "Watch out for uh, stochiastic parrots." And I don't know if you've if you've run into stochiastic parrots, but it says, "Remember, people, these large learning models." Models, all that it does is with some great programming, it takes a whole bunch of words, and I'm going to get a whole bunch of words, and maps it onto a new bunch of words. So when AI seems to be talking to you, it's really just looking at patterns and giving you a pattern. And yet, it's like a stochiastic parrot, which is basically, it looks like it's got life, but it doesn't. So let's go back to the accuracy part, right? Accuracy and foster. It's, it's, there are problems with accuracy. There are problems with accuracy. And it seems fast, but the thing is, for the average student or average person entering something into ChatGPT, what it gives you back may not be that useful without you doing some more questioning, what's referred to as prompt engineering, right? And with prompt engineering, you're fine-tuning your questions. You're asking it, oh, but can you do this? Oh, but can you do that? 
And more often than not, that's going to take you more time than if you just did something from the get-go. All right. Uh, let's put it into the let's put it into the context of our actual classrooms, right? Uh, a student could take one of your assignments and pop it into ChatGPT, and ChatGPT will give it an answer. It'll roll something out. Uh, and in you know, in my class, and this may surprise some of you, I actually say, uh, I, I you know, it, I actually say, look, I'm okay with you with you using chat GPT, but you've got to cite it and you've got to show me the logs of how you use it. So I can see that you've taken the printout and you've done something with it, all right? That's my where I've settled on it right now. But for many students, too many students will just take what chat GPT has given them and pop it in. And if you and I have not put our own assignments into chat GPT, we should, right? That's the first thing I did January 6th, well, maybe not January 6th, January 4th, 2023, okay? I stay away from that date. It has you know, tough memories, right? But January 4th, 2023, when ChatGPT was, was coming out, I took every assignment in my class, put it into ChatGPT, and, sh and, and looked at what it did. And here's the great news. ChatGPT, if I scored ChatGPT's responses on my rubric, it would only get about a 65. And I'm like, super, this is great. My assignment is is fine tuned enough that to the extent that it can, uh, the students have to think. One plus year later, uh, I keep modifying my assignments. I keep popping into Chat GPT, still making sure that nobody could get a hundred, you know, uh, by just using Chat GPT. So there are, it's out there. Our students are definitely using it. Uh, students are peeved, concerned, and mystified when their faculty don't even address AI usage. All right, and this is data we collected on our campus. 55% of them said, I, I really wish our faculty would talk about AI, right? Uh, I'll just say one other thing. There's just so much more I could say about AI. The one other thing I'll say for you and me as instructors, uh, I'll just give, here's a real short list of how AI could be super helpful. AI is great in fine, uh, fine tuning assignments. AI is great in giving you the beginnings of rubrics to grade, the beginnings, all right? It's never been perfect, but it gets it going. Um, and here's my absolute favorite people. Uh, every time I get my student evaluations, I copy, I cut all the written comments, pop it into chat, chat GPT and say, give me the five themes. And yes, I'm anal enough. I still read all 400 written comments anyway, but in two seconds, chat GPT summarizes my course evaluations and give me the main things I should look for. It's just been a game changer. It's been a game changer. So I'm going to stop there. And if I'm going to look, because I know I've been missing some questions, but there's just so much really neat stuff to say. Uh, but I'm going to end where I started. If you've not tried chat GPT people, please, please, please pop in, give it a shot. If you don't know what to say, say, tell me about Regan and John and, you know, see what it brings back. It brings, John, I've tried it. It brings back some pretty funky stuff. So so <laughs> I'm going to be even more specific. Go to ChatGPT and say, tell me about John Donlowski. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I've never used ChatGPT, but now you've kind of like, what in the world? Now I'm scared. Yeah. There have been a lot of comments in the chat saying it helps me get unstuck. I add in my first draft to add embellishment. So yeah, there's some good discussion in the chat of how people are using chat GPT that do use it. Um, I kind of want to move kind of in the exact opposite direction now from technology to connection. Um, so Regan, you mentioned earlier talking about office hours, having your students come to your office hours to get great scores, get less than great scores. And, um, you know, I would love for both of you to kind of expand on how we can create connection um, with first year students and how instructors can get them to come to office hours and really foster that really great connection right at the beginning. So students are feeling connected and engaged in their learning experience. Yeah, I, I was part of a pretty big group here at Kent State where we were trying to figure out how to get students to not to drink the water, so to speak, to come to the office hours or, or faculty or desperate for business. So to speak. And we have a relatively large uh, central location at Kent State where students can go and just get tutoring that they don't use. And the question is how to, how to pull them in. And what we found out is there's so many different reasons why students don't go to office hours. It's 
unbelievably baffling. So there's not going to be one single solution. Let me tell you two things, though, that I know work on our campus, right? And, and maybe these won't be so, but they'll probably be obvious. The first is accessibility. So our math program here at Kent State does a great job. They do tutoring and office hours, but the office hours are right after class. And they have all the TAs and tutors. And I know this is not, everyone won't have the bandwidth to do this, but they're available right after the class. So when students leave that class, they know I don't have to make special kind of um, arrangements. I can go sit down, talk to someone now about what's going on. And they really do have a pretty good show rate and students who really uh, use their office hours, hours well. For me, the only time I've had leverage in my own classroom typically is when I give students specific prompts on why they should be in my office hours. And, and by the way, I beg them to come. I tell them I, I have candy. You can't see it here. I, I, everything's on the up and up and, and great. So I'll do things like, you know, I know lots of students. I'm just looking around or are having difficult, difficulties taking notes. And, and it's not that it's I'm seeing un, incomplete notes. And you guys have noticed that in some of our uh, uh, our sessions during the class where I ask questions and so forth. Plus, I've noticed some of you guys aren't taking notes in the most effective way to help you learn. If you want to know how to do this better, I'm here for you. Please come in to my office hours. I typically, when it's a specific prompt like that, not just something generic, if you have any questions or so forth, I'll get takers. And, and no, typically, I really don't care that much necessarily about uh, notes per se, although I do want to help students who want it. I just want them to come to start the larger conversation. So it's a bunch of prompts like that where I'll go and it's like, look, this next lecture, it's on the modal model of memory. It's very important. Lots of students struggle. I want you to know that if you struggle, you're like everybody else. But I also know that students who come to my office hours to talk to me about this model end up doing a lot better. So if at all you're having difficulties, answering the end of class questions, why don't you just consider stopping by my office hours? So I give them something that they just don't have to show up like they're bothering me, but yet I've invited them with a specific prompt. Again, not necessarily because I absolutely want to talk about the modal model of memory, but I want to talk to students who want help because usually they're coming to me as that as an icebreaker so now we can have larger conversations about how they're doing in this class and other classes and where they can seek help. So that's, I found a little bit movement on my own that that works relatively well. I don't know, Regan, do you have anything that works? In yeah, your so so a couple of a couple of different things. Uh, first off, I think uh, uh, some of the, my, my, my biggest hits, as it were, uh, the thing that I get the most from is number one, uh, emailing students even before classes started. I normally do it three weeks before classes start. Uh, and I, I, I email them with a, hey, I see that you're, you're going to be in my class in a few weeks. Uh, thrilled to have you, blah, blah, blah. You know, and in that email, uh, the blah, blah, blah part is actually, here's a little bit about me. You know, before we get all serious about the topic, here's a little bit about me. Uh, you know, and and that, and, and here's something that, uh, I know some of you may balk at, but I boldly venture into it. Uh, I tell students, here's my uh, Instagram account uh, where I will be posting a lot of psychology nerdy stuff. And what I found is that they follow for the, for the nerdy stuff or whatever, and will often are more likely to reach out with a question there than they would in other places. Because at most of our campuses, Email systems are so bogged down, right? Notifications from learning management systems are so bogged down, you know, that they often miss stuff in there. So that 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 reach out early on uh, is number one. The second big big hit is uh, I've really changed my approach to what I do on the first day, and uh, I instead of before I hand out the syllabus, I hand out what I like to call uh, a syllabus snapshot, and I have a little show and tell for you. Uh, this is my this is my syllabus snapshot, and as you can see, it's very visual, uh, and it points out the main. Oops, let's see if I'm doing this in the opposite way. The main things that people need to do to to do well in class, but most important, importantly, as you could sort of see from the the title, it's called a thrival guide, and I literally say I don't just want you to survive in this class; I want you to thrive. Uh, 
on this, I, I very explicitly say, whoops, let's see if I can do this in reverse. Uh, support, support is really important. I have tons of contact information on there. I'm going to read this out. Got questions. I have multiple ways to get in touch with me. Uh, I say support and respect each other. You know, just the whole, it's just very different. And this is this snapshot. It has some of the basic stuff, you know, what's the percentages. But this is the first thing they see before my 14-page syllabus. You know, so it's this gentle, hey, I'm, I am really thinking about you and stuff like that. And, you know, Andrea, going all the way back to the beginning, uh, socialization to college, right, uh, is, a, is a big key. And, and I think our some of our first year students need a little bit more help with, with socialization. So uh, the last thing I'll say is even in my syllabus, I now have on my very first page, and I'm, let me see if I can pull mine, yeah. Uh, on my very, very first page, before all the university boilerplate, the very, very first thing that I have in my on my syllabus is uh, my approach to, to you and this class. And it's, and, uh, and, and where maybe I can send you a link to my syllabus and uh, so you can send it out with the summary to peer. But right there on that first page is a note about inclusive teaching, my approach, and uh, where I'm willing to be flexible as far as deadlines and things like that go. Because I think that's really, really important as well. It's that compassion, don't be a pushover, right? But uh, and I will say, in terms of studying well and learning well, structure is really important. Structure is really important, right? And so I'm going to say, look, this class is heavily structured. And to you to study like a champ, you need to structure your learning. You need to plan well. But I realize life happens. And here are all the things I put into place, you know, uh, when for when life happens. So, yeah. I love what you're thing about structure and you know first year students are coming often coming from an environment where their days have been structured for them by someone else and entering into college um they are now responsible for most of that structure um so i would love to hear from y'all on how you recommend teaching time management skills and getting first year students to really embrace the opportunity um, to create their own structure and what works for them. Yeah, let me jump in with just a, a couple quick comments about this. First, time management. If you send your child here to Kent State and the only thing they learn to do well is to manage their time in the four years they're here, we've earned our money at Kent State because that skill is so important throughout all of life. And incredibly important for really excelling and thriving. So having students learn good time management skills is important, but very difficult. It's not easy to manage your time. I mean, for those of you who are doing it, you don't realize how you probably struggled to finally get there, right? So when I teach first-year classes, uh, I'm sorry, first-year experience classes, I have them start with a very simple uh, worksheet. I wish I had this here like Regan did to show you all. But it just asks them like, okay, I want you to spend 10 minutes and write down five of your most important goals for this semester. And two of those goals has to be, have to be academic, but the other three don't need to be. So they're just writing down their goals. Now, you might think, well, that's kind of strange. A lot of students don't even think about what their goals are. So at least we're kind of starting like, hmm, I need to work towards something. Then uh, we talk about, okay, you have your goals down. I want you to just write a little bit. I mean, this takes time in class. Write a little bit about why you want those goals, right? And the idea is how committed are you to getting those goals? And they might realize some of them they're really committed to and some they aren't. Then it comes down to now I want you to spend time for each of those goals. Tell me your plan, your weekly plan and your semester plan on how you're going to obtain that goal, okay? So it's very step, very uh, progressive in nature, but leads them from both setting up the goals how they're going to plan to get them, and then eventually how they're going to evaluate whether they get there. And each week we return to them with the idea like, well, you know what? Your goals are, can change. I recently changed a goal. I had one I really, really wanted that I wasn't meeting. And since I wasn't meeting it every week, I decided, you know what? Maybe I don't want that goal as much as I thought. So I just got rid of it. That's a good way to not have to deal with it, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. The idea that the students can be extremely flexible, but yet they have to be the drivers of this bus, right? So they should be making conscious decisions about what they 
want to do and what they don't want to do. So sometimes I tell my students, I don't want you just to cram for your exams in my class. But if you decide that's the only time you have for the class because you think that your other classes are more important, that's totally fine because you're making a conscious decision to do that. You're not letting life basically happen to you. You're happening to life. That's critical. But by the way, <laughs> this is by no means a simple thing. So typically in, in my first year experience course, we go all, and this might seem condescending, we go all the way from setting big goals to, okay, everyone's going to bring in a calendar. And I'm going to show you what detailed goal structure looks like during the week. And every Sunday, I want you setting up the goals for that week. So when you wake up every morning, you know what you're doing. So on and so forth. So it gets more and more specific. Quite frankly, we talk about this in detail and study like a champ because I've been so adamant that the one thing I want all my students to take away is good time management skills. Because if they have that, man, they can get in anywhere in life. Anyway, so that's my two cents. Uh, Regan, do you have any like more? Yeah, you know, the, I think the only other thing is I, I want to add to that is it, it's a tough balance on how much of this to talk about especially in a large class, because I think may, very often we have the sense that, oh, we're boring the people who already know it. Uh, and I'll just tell all of you, most of them don't, <laughs> you know, and and I, I love my students dearly. And uh, I just see, I, I have noticed that with every passing year, I spend more time in class on how to plan, how to schedule, uh, you know, how to do things like that, and more and more. And as long as I think you talk about it a little bit in class or definitely talk about it to, to whatever extent you do, that nicely opens the door for those students who need more to come to you, right? And say, all right, this person is open to helping me with something like this. Uh, most of our campuses, our academic student services have great stuff for planning and, you know, uh, and structure and how to do all of that stuff. But students often don't use it. I'll be honest, when I looked at our, our student center does a great job, but it's pages and pages of stuff. And sometimes they just need that conversation to get them on, on, the, uh, on the right track, so. All right, so we are running out of time, but there is one topic, one more topic I wanna cover very quickly as I've seen some questions about it in Q and A and mention of it in chat. Um, and that is, um, reaching neurodivergent students and supporting them. There's been mentions of ADHD, dyslexia, um, executive, executive functioning um, deficits. So just very quickly, are there other ways that we can support students who are neurodivergent as we come, become more aware and cognizant of- I don't want to be about. quick, Andrea. I want to- talk, I know, I, I know. To talk about. But yes, I mean, uh, very quickly, I'll put this in the context of study skills just because it's something that is near and dear to my heart. Think about two ways to study. I'm going back and rereading a textbook, which seems fine, rereading, right? Versus I'm going to go back and take uh, test questions about that same material. So I'm going to use retrieval practice versus reread. Reading is basically begging students to mind water. So if you have ADHD, neurodivergence, boy, that's really not going to be an effective technique because it's not engaging whatsoever. What we find, though, is that when students use something that's more engaging, like taking tests, well, to take a test, you eventually have to answer the question, right? And it turns out that those kinds of engaging study skills, the research shows they're just as effective for individuals with a variety of different kinds of neurodivergence, ADHD, and so forth, because they are engaging and they get the same benefit from using the skills. In fact, things like self-testing are so potent. Individuals who have motor accidents and have different kinds of aphasia, the best way to teach them how to speak again is using retrieval practice with feedback. It's engaging and it's potent. And I'm, I'm going to just stop talking there. But yes, there are a variety of ways that you can give a, uh, students with neurodivergence different kinds of skills to use that will help them stay on track. Those same study skills will help students without neurodivergence stay on track. That's the good news. Thank you so much. And I know we did not give that topic the time it deserves. Um, so maybe a future session, uh, we can touch on that a little bit more. I know there are lots of topics we didn't get to. I want to thank everyone for 
your time and attention and wonderful, thoughtful questions. Um, any questions that we have that were not answered today, I will compile in a Q&A document and send that at a later date when we can answer those, those questions in writing. Um, everyone who attended will also be receiving a copy of this recording. And I want to sincerely thank John and Regan so much for being here today. I think everyone who attended today has at least one little great nugget that they can take out into the world with them and help support their first year students that they're interacting with on a regular basis. So thank you to everyone for attending. We hope to see you at a future event. And thank you so much, John and Regan, for being here today. My pleasure. That was a blast. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I wish we could go on and on, but <laughs> being respectful of everyone's time, it is now time uh, to end the webinar. I'm seeing lots of hearts and claps, and um, I 100% echo everyone's um, positive comments about today's session. It was great. It was helpful to me, um, and so I can only imagine how helpful it's been to everyone here today. Uh, someone said 90 minutes next time. We'll consider that. <laughs> we'll definitely consider that. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day, and we'll see you again hopefully sometime soon. All right. Take care, folks. Bye-bye. Yeah.